So, um, my name is Norman, my colleague Martin is with me as well. Uh, we both work for Intel Mobile Communications. Um, and as you can see, uh, we want to address a problem, uh, a topic today uh, that we are facing within our team. And we want to give you an idea of how we solved it and hopefully you get some benefit from that, you get some ideas um, for yourself. Rather, it uh, solves a problem that you're facing or rather it's something that you could see as an improvement going forward. Um, uh, the presentation is called uh, Planned Parenthood, but I think the subtitle gives a bit more insight into that, and that's what I want to spend some time on before I head over to Martin to give you the in uh, information, kind of the technical details and uh, nuts and bolts. So, um, so the first slide, only very quickly about the environment we're, going, we're working in and, and what makes uh, this setup special, maybe, and why we actually come to the point of uh, presenting here. Um, so we both work as uh, software system engineers in a, in a team. We're just providing uh, the build and test automation framework for the software development that happens within Intel Mobile Communication. Um, Intel Mobile Communication is a part of Intel, which is responsible for development and release and, and so on for uh, wireless platforms. So we talk about um, modem, uh, Bluetooth, for Bluetooth, wireless, and, and other communication methods within mobile phone industry. Um, the tools we, we produce and we have our um, around roughly 4,000 developers use, uh, they follow a continuous in integration approach, which is where, uh, which is the point where Jenkins comes into play and where it becomes handy. Um, what's important to note is that we have quite a dense number of tests and builds which are executed in this infrastructure on a daily basis. Um, and similar to the people who spoke before, especially uh, Greg from Salesforce mentioned it, that uh, it gets quite intense and, and there are some problems associated with that that I, I like to get uh, spend some minutes on. Um, so we talk about 50,000 builds roughly per, per day. Those are in, in between minutes or up to half an hour. So it, it, it uh, varies uh, quite a bit. And um, Jenkins, we consider it as one of the main tools within, within the project that we're working on and we want to move the existing system we have, the continuous integration system and mainly the build and test automation to the next level. And from what we looked at, over the tools that are available out there, open source and closed source. Uh, we consider Jenkins to be uh, a great framework to start with. It has the, the biggest overlap of what we saw as the requirements for such a system and what's available um, out there. Um, also the fact that it's very, very much, um, there's a lot of contributions happening from the open source world and events like this thing make this very interesting to see. There's a lot of interest in the tool and a lot of uh, development still going on. So those are, those are the, the very good points about the tool and the things that make it uh, very interesting to us, but there's a couple of challenges we see with using Jenkins, and that they are mainly associated with the number of builds and the intensity we want to use the tool in. Um, similar to, um, I think um, James from the um, from the Open Cloud talk said it earlier. Uh, there's a concept of a pre-commit quality get or pre-commit test. So before the user has the chance to commit code, he's asked to uh, pass a few quality checks so that the main line, the, the software that is currently on development isn't broken, so is in a stable state. And because of that, we have a huge amount of tests constantly with the system uh, while the developers are, are interacting with it. And because of that, because of also the, the company is stealing has offices worldwide, we, we won't be able over long term to cope with one Jenkins server only. So that one of the problems we face is the scalability, uh, having, mul having just one uh, Jenkins server providing infrastructure to all those developers. So that's one of the problems. That's the one we're not going to address today. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you have similar problems or if you also uh, want to use Jenkins in a bigger environment, come and talk to us. You know, uh, I think it's a good opportunity to share some ideas and see where we can go from here. The talk today is about uh, another problem, and that's on the next slide. So we have more than 1,000 jobs in the system. Um, and the importance there is that there's a lot of overlap between them. So what uh, a Jenkins job does and it can be a build, it can be a test, um, is pretty much the same across all those thousands. So what we need in order to keep this maintainable, keep this uh, manageable, have a way of sharing, uh, sharing information between them, sharing build steps, sharing whatever can be configured in the system across all of them. I think the presentation earlier, before that, about this templating mechanism also addresses this, but from our, from our point of view, not in the full scope. So we wanted to go a step further, which is what this presentation is about. So just to emphasize on this a little bit more, you see um, the way, um, so what, what those builds and tests use is similar, the way how they use it is, uh, is different. 
So it's, you can kind of abstract it away in a way, but it needs to be made specific to uh, make sense for project A or for project B. Um, what's important as well is that under high load especially, and that's what we are experiencing, changing this configuration is, is, is difficult and crucial. So you need to be able to uh, protect it and control what is being changed and who can change what, and that's also something we, we would like to address. So with those few points, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Martin to give you some more information and now the, the proper. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Martin Schroeder, and I thank Norman uh, for introducing our slide set. And uh, on the, in the following um, roughly three-quarter hour, I will be presenting you um, what we did to address the problems uh, Norman asked, uh, brought up. And to do that, I want to just give you a quick overview about what you're going to be seeing next, because I would like to ask you, if you have any questions, to please defer them just to the end of, uh, uh, of this presentation, because there will be a break afterwards, so it would be uh, best to answer them uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that setting, so we can really um, try to cover all those um, questions that would pop up, but we would answer later anyway. Um, so that we can just go through the flow of the, um, the slides and hope to address those questions before they actually pop up and uh, would just cause uh, unnecessary um, disruptions. Okay, so um, my very first, uh, uh, the very first thing I want to present to you is the present state of Jenkins and what is fundamentally good about it and what is fundamentally not broken but fundamentally difficult to use uh, if you have such a huge product uh, like we have. So the first slide, uh, slide set will be about why, we, why are we using Jenkins at all. After that, I will um, give you an insight about uh, what inheritance is, how we understand it in uh, terms of um, Jenkins jobs, and uh, why, we want to f why we find this to be a very, very nice idea to have and to um, ease our, um, ease our, uh, uh, our problems with the system. And after that, I will very briefly um, give just an overview of the existing plugins uh, and uh, show that while they do some things right, they also will not fulfill the full scope of uh, our problems. And uh, yeah. So at the moment, uh, the capabilities of vanilla Jenkins are very much that you have a very easy to use uh, GUI configuration of jobs, which is a very good thing. But on the other hand, also a very bad thing. The very good thing about it is that you can basically tell a user to just uh, look at the system, see what has actually changed without necessarily needing to understand a domain-specific language for testing, and so on. They can just basically click together what they want to uh, actually do. But the problem with that approach is that it also makes it very easy to break something very horribly. Because if you... Um, can have thousands of jobs defined, which, is, which Jenkins is perfectly uh, fine of uh, dealing with, and you also augment those with uh, custom plugins like triggering Maven scripts, running end scripts, build scripts, lots and lots of publishers that do post-step analysis for some things, you end up with jobs that have, have very different settings and very different use cases. For example, you can see here just a few uh, buzzwords that you will certainly have seen whenever you started up a Jenkins instance. It's really amazing. You can do everything with the system, but you can also break everything. Because what you can't do in the current system is share settings. Every job is fundamentally independent of every other job. So say, you have a source code management system in place. I hope you have, uh, because it's a very good idea. Uh, and all your jobs are fundamentally using the very same thing. So in Jenkins proper, you would need to go into every single job and reconfigure the source code management system again and again and again. Now imagine for 10, 20 jobs, this is not a huge problem. But if you have 1,000 jobs that are all checking out the same things, and you have, say, um, yeah, a build manager or some developer who goes into your system because he needs access to just to change what his job is uh, doing, and he introduces a small typo in, in the system and suddenly um, uh, addresses a server that's either out outdated because it has been shut down, brought down for maintenance mode, anything, that gets uh, really, really ugly fast. So... Um, Two workarounds for this are available in Jenkins itself, and the third one will be available um, if you use uh, the templating mechanism that uh, Koski showed earlier in uh, this uh, room. 
Uh, the first is the downstream uh, jobs and join trigger settings. Um, basically, you can just stagger jobs together um, so that they run in sequence and wait for other jobs to finish and then continue with other jobs. This is very nice for um, chaining jobs together and it allows a limited reuse of build steps. For example, if you would have um, a mix, uh, um, just a build step and afterward a testing step, these could be separated into two jobs and they could run in sequence so that you could have some amount of uh, uh, configuration splitting going on. This is fine, but the problem is, just as the very first problem that crops up when you use such a system is that parameter assignment becomes is really impossible, or at least very, very hard to do, because you can't really control what those jobs do. You can just trigger them. And if you do a bit of hacking, you might be able to uh, convince them to do something slightly different, like running on a different, when you have a static analysis tool, running a different kind of uh, static analysis, like a smaller or more limited scope, maybe you are able to do that, but that's not the scope of this, pl uh, of this particular plugin or this particular feature. So it's not useful for um, actually fixing uh, what we want to do here. The second one uh, is the metrics build uh, plugin that we've already seen in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, yeah, lecture about, uh, that Koski gave, gave. And it allows you to start jobs with different parameters uh, or hosts or anything really. So this solves somewhat the problem raised by the earlier plugin that now you're able to chain jobs together with different kinds of parameters running on different kinds of platforms. But the problem with that is that it always ends up using the same build steps. And if you don't use other plugins to work around this issue, you again have the problem that you're sharing some things, but you're not sharing all things. And that's the problem with both solutions. So now I want to give you just the rationale why we think inheritance is here a very good idea. Because it's quite obvious. Identical settings that you share across thousands of jobs should be defined only once if they never change. Because otherwise, those settings will diverge immediately. For example, that I gave earlier, the example I gave earlier was the source code management. It's often identical and perhaps only for some of the repository name changes. Everything else, the um, server that you use, the login credentials that you use, they are all the same. So how do you solve this issue? Well, for us, the natural way of doing this was inheritance because, well, Jenkins is written in Java. Java is an object-oriented language that has inheritance features, so why not go down the similar road? I mean, it's just shown to be quite uh, uh, powerful. So instead of defining the common properties again and again and again, you simply um, put those common properties inside another job, which is just what we call a job fragment. It doesn't define something that can be run on its own. For example, it would only define what do I need to do to check out Git. So the only field you set in this huge configuration screen is actually the SCM plugin that just checks out code and uses a few parameters to drive, for example, um, what kind of repository to check out because everything else will be probably identical. But you can go from there uh, in whatever direction you want to. And then the other jobs, say this job one, job two, job three, they only reference that, yeah, I'm a good job and then they reuse this particular um, settings. And the inheritance will tell them, okay, you get from me your CM settings, the only thing you need to give me is a particular parameter, what kind of repository you want to check out. Everything else is hidden from the user. So they just mark themselves as, I want to load in this fragment, and it will be loaded in for them. Um, there are some plugins that follow roughly this approach. The first is, for example, the conditional build step plugins that some of you might use. Uh, it allows exactly this. It allows to um, take uh, build steps that you're uh, reusing again and again, putting them in the global configuration, and then just uh, uh, saying in the job, okay, now I want to um, yeah, run this particular make step. If you were here for the earlier presentation, this is pretty much the approach that the templating system also takes. You configure a template globally, and then just reference that and put that in. Uh, the problem with that particular plugin, though, is that, yeah, well, it can only handle build steps. It can't help, it can't configure publishers or anything else you might have in the project. So it's not a full solution. Uh, the templating uh, solution um, that was presented earlier gives you more, available, more availability to do that. But the main problem we see with that approach is, well, the templates are globally stored. 
So what you in effect have is not um, a real inheritance tree where you can have um, jobs that load certain settings from other jobs and only at the very leaf of this inheritance tree has final jobs that can actually be executed. You have a flat hierarchy. Every job you define needs to uh, make use of all the other templates uh, uh, there are. So for example, if you have two build steps, one is say, doing a, um, just a make step to build something, and the second one is a static analysis tool that just checks whether everything that was produced before makes sense, well, you would need to put them in the same template. Or you would need to do them in two separate templates uh, uh, that have nothing whatsoever to do uh, with each other. So your final job would still look the same, it would reuse global configuration, but there would be no connection between the global configurations. So that's a problem from our side. And I can show you later on, um, on a slide set, why you would probably not want to have this global configuration, at least in that respect. Um, the second uh, plugin is a so-called uh, managed scripts plugin, where you um, do something uh, very, uh, just a second, I needed to look up, perhaps I've just, ah, fuck, yeah, sorry, so, oh, sorry for exploded. Uh, I, I switched that around, I was uh, running an autopilot. Uh, what I just explained was this managed script plugin, sorry. And, <laughs> and what uh, the second plugin is this conditional build step plugin, which does something similar by um, allowing you to just conditionally execute your um, build steps. So for example, you can have a project that contains 10 different kind of build steps, and you only execute a few of them depending on input variables or what kind of files are stored um, on, a, on the workspace when you actually run it. And uh, just like the previous uh, uh, setting, this is also incomplete. It helps you to define a job that will then um, do different things no, uh, depending on how you call them, but uh, the settings are again not shared at all. You still have, uh, have a very, very complex uh, final job. So going to the third plugin, that was quick. Uh, the third plugin is the configuration slicing um, plugin, which um, goes somewhat in the direction of the templating mechanism, but the other way around, where um, you are able to change m the configuration settings of multiple jobs through one interface. So it's, uh, it's integrating into the global configuration of Jenkins and will allow you to look at a particular kind of configuration, list how all the jobs are defined, uh, where they are defined differently or the same, and then change them all in one bulk step. Uh, for example, you can here see on the slides um, there are, um, there's a slicer for parameters, a slicer for the source code management, and a slicer for the actual build steps that get executed. This is relatively powerful because you can change multiple jobs through one interface and it uh, automatically applies to all of them. But uh, the problem is that it's very difficult to use, even surprisingly so, because you might accidentally overwrite something you didn't want to have overwritten, in effect, because you're just treating the job still separately and just overwriting certain fields or changing them in one go, there's still no real sharing, and this makes things very, very difficult. So, um, having told you what already does exist, I want to go over to what we implemented and why we think this is actually better. And to do that, um, I have to dig a slightly bit deeper into the innards of uh, Jenkins, but not too much. You will only see two lines of code. And um, after that, I will show you uh, how we extend um, this uh, particular um, area of the Jenkins code to allow for true inheritance to occur between jobs. And in the third part, I will go into one particular difficulty that we had um, with the system just to sh show you uh, yeah, uh, how you would basically be able to use this in a more um, powerful way, even though Jenkins, vanilla Jenkins itself is uh, not pr really prepared for such a, an advanced feature, at least um, at the moment. Um, executable items in Jenkins are derived from the job class. As you've seen in previous uh, slides, pretty much everything you could imagine in Jenkins is a job. And these jobs are actually governed by three um, different classes, job, abstract project, and project. They all define settings for the various things you can set in Jenkins. For example, the source code management, the parameters, the build steps, and so on. These settings are stored inside uh, these uh, class objects and will eventually get serialized to disk uh, in the backup mechanism or the 
bring down, bring up mechanism of Jenkins. But that's not important here. The important thing is that these settings are, uh, are stored in fields, but they are exposed to functions. So if you want to implement inheritance, for example, um, by just looking at this uh, small function, it's a function that gets called from Jenkins whenever it wants to get a list of all the build steps you've defined in the project. So by overriding this particular, um, by this particular function, we are capable of doing things a bit differently. Instead of just fetching the properties defined in this one job, we can uh, uh, fetch properties that are defined in this job and all the parent jobs that were defined to be, um, yeah, to contain these fragments of build steps or publishers that were, uh, that are necessary to actually make the build go. So um, extending this class pretty much involves just uh, adding new fields to um, say my job is related to this job or this job and this job. To basically say I want to get features from here, I want to get features from here, I want to get features from here. The second thing we needed to add was new GUI pages to display this inheritance because by default they are all anonymous jobs side, uh, sitting side by side by side. And if you do something as uh, relatively complex as doing inheritance, you need to display the relationships that different projects have to each other so that you can easily go from one project to another to find out where was this particular snippet of settings uh, configured. So what we do is we overwrite um, these functions I've already stated earlier and um, implement our changes for um, inheritance. But this raises a problem. For example, you can see here, this is actually a snippet from our code we're not just plainly overriding uh, the function. We're actually making one function do two things. The first function is just the over overriding, and as you can see, we're calling, it with a, um, we're calling the same function again with a new parameter, which just tells um, our system whether you want to see um, all the properties that are defined for this project and all its parents, or whether you only want to see the properties defined on the current parent. So you might ask yourself, why is this necessary? Well, this goes back to pro two problems with uh, Jenkins's behavior. The first is that Jenkins does not distinguish between building and configuring jobs because it made no sense. After all, a job was always separate. A job always configured everything there was by itself. So building and configura configuration weren't treated any differently. The fa same function was called. This is not true anymore when you go to inheritance because there you have a problem. Uh, values must not be inherited when you configure something because if you would display all those uh, settings that you inherit from, from the parents like the SCM property, the build steps, the publishers, if, it would, if you would display them all in, uh, in the configuration view and the um, user clicked on save, Jenkins would happily overwrite your uh, local configuration with all the settings it could import from the parents, which is not what we want. We want to have the settings staying in the parents and only being used during build. So uh, just as an example, we, we have um, here just uh, four uh, jobs. The first is uh, the final job. We really only want to execute. So when we build, we are interested in the properties that this particular um, job has. But this job, through these GUI fields that we added, marks itself as, well, I import other properties from this configuration A job. And this configuration A job is, in our example here, set up to import some other things like for example, the source code management system from, it, uh, from a third job. And the same happens again when the final job also inherits from properties from configuration uh, C. So the, what we have now here is that, uh, say, um, the source code management properties are configured in configuration uh, B. So these properties are always the same f between all the jobs. And you can inherit them down uh, uh, the tree, which is perfectly fine for building. They will co the sy Jenkins system will uh, collect all those um, properties for you. But if you configure something, this needs to stop. Because when you configure something, you only want to change the properties of this one final job. Because otherwise, when you change configuration A or anything else, you would in, um, inherit these properties that are completely uh, unnecessary for just adjusting this one job. Because when you're configuring this one job, you're only interested in configuring what's actually different from all the other jobs, because they are always the same. Uh, the same. So you need to basically cut the inheritance here. And this is why we needed these two different functions and why 
when you actually work with our plugin, you will see that the configuration screen only, con this, uh, only makes avail uh, well, shows you the settings that are defined locally and not all the settings that are um, inherited from everywhere else. We, show, we actually show a different page for that so that you can see what the job will actually execute in contrast to just what it references. Um, and the second problem is, has to do with parameters and how parameters are handled because um, ideally we want to define parameters in some parent job. For example, when you have this um, SCM job, you will have, want to have a parameter for the repository name. And this uh, variable would need to be, be defined in this one job that defines the SCM settings because that's where you're interested in. But it needs to be actually filled with data in the final leaf job because that's where you actually need to say that you want to use that repository. So um, this was a problem because the parameters don't define whether you want to say take the la latest uh, uh, settings or whether you just like a command line want to um, append the different um, settings one after another. So we had to introduce a parameters class that allows you to um, fine tune how they are inherited. And as you can see here, for example, um, this is a, just a new string parameter and you can select whether you want to overwrite whatever was defined in a parent, so you actually fill it with just with value or you want to um, extend whatever was uh, defined there, which is highly useful if, for example, you have a um, compilation job and it has, you need to um, assemble together a command line for actually compiling it, most of the parameters will be always the same and you always need to have them. But you might want to add additional parameters at the end, for example, to make it uh, do some slightly different new uh, version of the build or target it to a different platform. In that case, you could easily extend this parameter to go from one, uh, basically to extend uh, whatever was defined in parent job versus known good to build something and extend your own, sorry, and extend your own settings uh, on top of that. Uh, and if that has completely confused uh, you by now, this might be understandable. Uh, so what I want to do next is just to show you a use case. Because if you have not yet understood what this might bring to you, uh, a visual demonstration will certainly um, help you um, just understand why we th think this is a powerful feature and why it's really useful. Uh, and for that, I will just show you just the prerequisites that are necessary to understand this uh, use case, then show you what, how we would implement this when you have inheritance in contrast to how you would do it when you had no, uh, normal Jenkins, and then I will just compare these three settings. So imagine you have the following task. You have a very complex uh, modularized uh, application that has uh, several different modules that are developed in separation but always used together. Examples would be, um, for example, the uh, X server or GNOME or anything else. These are huge products that split themselves apart into different kind of modules that are basically developed separately. Uh, but the problem is all those modules have virtually identical requirements. They all pretty much uh, check out some SCM system, configure them with a particular tool, and at the end compile them as a library that you can then use later on. Uh, at the end, but you will want to link them together and maybe test them. Or you might run some static analysis on it. Again, all these kinds of things will be identical across most of the job. There will only be a tiny bit of fine tuning necessary for that. So uh, our, the approach for, an, for the inheritance is to not redefine those modules again and again and again and again. Instead, you take this monolithic project that you might have had, for example, to compile one library, and split it up. You split it up into what makes this particular um, library unique among all its brethren, and split those properties that are the same into other fragments, like the source code management, like how the build will actually be executed or how a test will be run. And then you will just reference those and re reuse them again and again between your jobs. Um, for example, as I've again and again repeated, the SCM is one such thing that is always the same. For example, you might have uh, a job which just defines how to use the source code management system because usually it's always the same thing. You need a repository name, you need your logon credentials, and this is always the same no matter whether you are using Git or SVN. So here it makes 
in this little example also uh, sense to just split those properties apart so that you can uh, make use that when you want to just change a little thing, it will also be applied to everything else. For example, you need a new server for our Git, you can change that there. Or you need a new um, logon credential because you're using a different kind of authentication, you will add that in the SCM property and will automatically be inherited by the Git and SVN jobs. The very same thing will, be, um, will happen in the build, jobs, uh, in the build uh, types, where you would, for example, use different make tools, and they will also uh, share some settings. So again, you would have a build property, which would, for example, say, put my, um, my final executables in this directory, and this directory is hidden behind a parameter or something. So again, this will be the same, and then you define actually what it means to run, for example, make, that you uh, run a particular make file, anything like that. It depends on your setup. And the same can be uh, done for the testing or any number of different kind of uh, properties you could set. For example, emailing a um, developer after the job has run. Uh, so how do you configure this first module job? Back in the old Jenkins system, all these properties that you've now defined in all the fragments would need to be put there. Uh, when you use inheritance, you don't need to do that. You only define the few parameters that actually manipulate uh, what it wants to do. For example, it checks out in the repo name module A and sets a particular variable called ldflex equals minus lm, which would make use of the math library if you used uh, uh, GCC. So what you instead do, instead of now defining git, make, and so on, you just say, okay, I want to make use of git. I know I'm a make tool, so I use make and it will automatically run my make file, and at the end, I run a particular lint tool suit. These are only references to these jobs. These jobs already define for you how this particular setup looks like. And um, if you were here for the previous, um, previous uh, lecture by uh, Koske, uh, this is pretty much like the templating system. You have a template for running make. You have a template for, uh, for using Git or anything else, and you just reference those, uh, those templates. But uh, the advantage in this system is that you can stagger that uh, no, uh, as deeply as you want. For example, you might want to uh, have people define uh, on the make step how the make runs, but you always want to force them to use the same parameter to tell um, the system where to build, uh, where to put your build artifacts. So now you could have a different uh, user uh, managing the build side of the thing and a different user um, managing what it, what it means to make, uh, do the make run. But the module A owner doesn't need to care. They will only make use of this reference to make and it will automatically get spliced in, into the project when they, try, uh, when they will execute it. And now you can do the same thing with the secondary module. It will also use git, make, lint, and so on. And it will just, it just work like that. Again, you have now defined this module B before, you needed to uh, write down all the different properties and make, needed to make sure that they're always the same. Now, these two jobs just share these references. They don't have any, uh, any definition. The, o the only thing the module B owner needed to say is, I want to run make to produce my, my system. Nothing else. He didn't need to know where your make binary is stored or uh, what kind of parameters are necessary to make it really run in your, in your environment. He only ref uh, said, I want to import these properties. And then, for example, you could have a, a, another uh, module which does the same but now uses um, SVN instead of Git or, or CMake instead of Make. But the module itself could just switch around. So for example, this might be a very old module that uses these two systems. If you now, um, if the module C owner now wanted to change this, instead of using SVN, using Git, all they would need to do is just move, from, move their reference from SVN to Git. It's as easy as that, just uh, checking a different box. And since um, both Git and SVN use the same parameters like this SC, uh, for, that they have inherited from the SCM job, it will work just like that if you've set it, correct, uh, set it up correctly. They will just switch what the project, where the project is uh, coming from and it will just work without having to know all the logon details that they need to, get, need to access the Git server with and so on. And at the end, you can gen just through normal uh, uh, Jenkins ways stagger these um, jobs together like in these uh, downstream trigger uh, or any uh, downstream trigger plugin or any other uh, job and then just build them to get your final executable. Um, 
the main advantage of this tool is that without a ver inheritance, you have far fewer jobs. But they have identical settings that are spread across all of them. And the module owner could accidentally change an important settings, a setting, like in Git. So you can't isolate the roles of people who write your build infrastructure and people who actually decide what a job should do. You would always have to merge both, uh, both roles together, which is, in a company um, of Intel's size, not really wanted. Because we have people who are experts on getting our um, build system to run. They know what it needs to be done to run, uh, to build, uh, in our case, a, a modem uh, software. The actual um, developers that are developing a small sub-module, for example, for just yeah, the RF interface or the GPS module, don't care. They only want to make sure that if they specify, I want to build a modem, it gets built. And the only thing they need to provide to us is just this one parameter that makes their platform different from all the other platforms. So we can easily split, uh, split apart those roles and configure everything in isolation. So with inheritance, you have certainly more jobs. But these jobs take on a very specific uh, role. And you have m less settings per job because you don't need to redefine all the settings again and again. You change them in one location, they get changed in all the other locations. You define them in one location and they get applied to all the other um, parents, uh, the, all the other childs that are below them. So changing and adding job becomes much easier, just like you've seen in the, um, in the previous uh, slide set by uh, Koski. In the end, it boils down, the user just opens his product, says, I'm a, git, uh, I want, I'm a git job, I'm a make job, and I want to have these additional parameters. And as soon as he clicks save, this project is, built, uh, is created for them, and he can be sure that it does the right thing. Previously, he would need to um, check back again with all the people who define the SCM settings, who define the make settings, whether what they actually just configured makes sense. So using inheritance is all about taking control. And this is a big difference between uh, our plugin and the plugin that uh, the plugins that already exist or are um, currently in planning, as far as we can see, because they don't really care about taking control of the system in a way where you can isolate roles and can make sure that when you introduce a change, it will not immediately break everything. Because um, with uh, yeah, uh, with inheritance, you get uh, sorry, with inheritance. Uh, you get a lot of advantages, and uh, the advantages are basically you are able to structure the jobs in a much better way, and you can control access to specific important settings so that people can't actually accidentally break, break them, and the entire thing is very simplified. So the, basically the thing you should uh, take away from this, uh, from this presentation is that it's a very good idea that if you define something once and use them multiple times, to define them only once and not again, again, again. Because then you won't need any copy and pasting. You can um, isolate rules so that people only change the things they're interested in. And uh, having such a feature like inheritance also enables more powerful features to be built on it. For example, we are currently working on introducing a versioning system, in, uh, a, versioning, a versioning approach for jobs in Jenkins itself where when you, for example, would change the Git, uh, the Git job so that it uses new credentials, you might not be sure whether that actually works with every repository any owner would, ha would have. So what um, our plugin will, will do is when you save a new version of this modem plugin, it will create a complete uh, new version which will not be immediately used, but which you can refer um, just by um, rebuilding builds or testing them because you can say, okay, uh, I inherited from modem, but I don't want to use the stable version that was just changed. I want to use the experimental version. It's only a, de a, a decision that you need to make once when you try to build the se setting. You just switch from one version to another, just like you switched from, uh, one, particular uh, from, from one particular parent to another. And uh, this feature allows for, even, uh, for taking even more control, because as, as soon as you've split away all these settings to um, a different job and a different um, set of owner, they will be able to um, really make sure that their changes work before releasing them out into the open. Before that, the people needed to um, just configure their one job, and if you wanted to ever change something, you would need to tell everybody, please change these settings to uh, your source code management system, and this would be a huge overhead, and if they make some error, they immediately break their build, which might cause days of uh, downtime, 
which really can't be afforded if you have uh, have such a very um, a very system on, under a very very high load. So, um, what would you need to do once uh, you have this uh, plugin uh, installed in your system as soon as we release it? Basically, the first thing is you need to um, just recreate your jobs by using this new um, project class. So. This is sensible because you will reorganize those jobs anyway, because you will split away all those things that are defined multiple times. Uh, and it's uh, necessary because, well, you need to select this job. But um, automatic conversion uh, is certainly possible. You would just end up with a, a plugin that does not inherit from anything. So this would only be a starting point. And one downside of this approach, unfortunately, is that uh, only freestyle projects can be converted because things like matrix projects and Maven projects, we don't have an actual feel about how you could even uh, introduce inheritance to them. For example, if you have this matrix project that you might have seen where you can uh, change parameters and run different projects with different configurations, it might not make sense to introduce something like inheritance there. But in our particular case, where we have lots of jobs and they all do the same thing and only d uh, differ in one or two parameters, such a feature is highly, highly useful. Okay, and uh, then the last question is, uh, that we will uh, address here is, when will we release the thing so you can actually try it and see whether it's useful for you is? Well, we will release it on an open source license and it will be free to use by uh, anyone because we're highly interested in getting your input uh, about what could be uh, done better, um, how could we um, fine tune it to cover your, uh, your um, use cases or more general use cases. And eternally, we are already using it at Intel for our um, projects to really get control of these thousands of jobs that we have uh, configured. But before we can do the external open release, we need to clean it up a bit. Because, uh, of course, uh, it's currently only an internal project, and we need, really want to make sure that it's stable and uh, reliable and that it's easily configurable uh, before we release something. And also we want to add some additional features to it that we've uh, already addressed, like for example the versioning system, which we have currently in a testing mode, but we want to make sure it works fine with Jenkins before we release it to you. And of course it needs uh, internal review by um, our corporation to make sure that it actually fulfills their, um, their desires for um, really working software. Because if we release something to you that might not work or would break, this is not in the interest of Intel. So um, the release is actually ex expected to happen in the next uh, few months. Um, and you can really uh, talk to us after this, uh, this presentation if you have any further questions. Okay, with that, I would uh, like to thank you for your attention. And I would also like to thank all the uh, various sponsors that have sponsored this uh, great conference. Thank you. <laughs>